The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Discipleship for Jennifer and I, part of the discipleship that we saw changed lives over a period of time. And to this day, it's still throughout my ministry, people would come to the church, not always, but primarily because they saw someone else who was a Christian for a length of time, and then suddenly they were changed. That's probably the best witness for life transformation there is, is when someone sees a change in someone else. Hmm? And I want to cover just exactly how the Holy Spirit taught me to do it, to bring a, 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 Jim Gall used the expression, a rapid acceleration of what other people pioneered. I think that's a good, um, when we minister to him, he says, you and Jennifer have brought a rapid acceleration to what other people pioneered. In other words, you can, you can get to California by wagon train, you can get there by plane. All right. So I don't argue with what works and what doesn't work. There's a lot of things that work. But I don't know about you, but I want the shortest way, quickest way possible, right? There's no instant maturity, but like time-lapse photography, there can be an acceleration. And the Holy Spirit can bring about that kind of acceleration. And historically in the church, guess what we do? Historically, we have a tendency with all good intentions to make it harder than it has to be. Do you believe that? Uh huh. I could just hear all those people when... When Martin Luther restored back to the church that were saved by grace through faith, it's a gift of God. And I could just hear all those people that were working for it all those years getting upset. Hmm? What do you mean? What do you mean? After all these years, I've been on groveling and begging and pleading. And then you just tell me, oh, just ask Jesus to come in your heart. That would be irritating, wouldn't it? Huh? Well, I want to cover something. And that is God ministers to our entirety. And understanding, this is the part I said, Kingdom Life Church people and those watching by YouStream, if you want to memorize something, memorize what it is when we talk in the Bible about your heart. Yes, something that simple can be misunderstood. It's not the blood pumper. Your heart is spirit, mind, will, and emotions all together. Uh. And any good Bible school will teach you that true repentance involves Spirit, your conscience, that's the voice of your spirit. Conscience, mind, will, and emotions. All of those need to be engaged. You cannot skip one for convenience sake because it will have a tendency to, uh, to corrupt the rest. The heart needs to be purified in the conscience. The mind needs to be under the lordship of Jesus. The will needs to be surrendered and the emotions need to be in communion or contact with God. Spirit to spirit, heart to heart. The emotions need to be the fruit of the spirit, not carnal emotions. You can't live by your carnal emotions. Now let me give you a little story. Matthew 8 verses 19 and 20. There was a certain scribe that came to Jesus and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now here's an exciting disciple come running up to Jesus. I, I, I want to follow you wherever you go. And he goes, Foxes, what he's basically ministering to, not his conscience, he wasn't ministering <clears throat> to his emotions. He wasn't ministering to his will. He was saying, you haven't thought this through. We're not going to be staying at the Holiday Inn. Foxes have holes, birds, have... son of man has nowhere to lay his head. You need to use good common sense. You need to think things through. Now, within the hearing of that disciple, Matthew 8, 21, 22 says, another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. 
This one, he tells, think about it. You haven't thought it through. He was dealing with his thought life. The thought life was not in the whole picture of the heart, the whole heart. We're supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart. That means clean conscience, a pure conscience. That means a mind that's sober. It means emotions that are in communion with God. And it means a will that is surrendered, not in rebellion. You want to hear from God? You need all of those placed before Him openly. And you'll hear from God more clearly. One of those can distort it. One of those bad boys, they're like three bad kids, the soul, the flesh, mind, will, and emotions. It's like, it doesn't matter which one's in the way, it'll, it'll grab the other two and go, come on, come on, come on let's, do, let's do it our way, come on. You want what you want, and you want it now, right? Let's go. All right? Now, that disciple said, let me first go bury my father. And... Jesus said, you follow me right now. One, he's telling, think it through. The other one, he's saying, come right now. He was dealing with the emotional area of that disciple, saying, this area is not complete. You're still tied to mommy and daddy. Let me first bear, then I'll follow you. I heard people in my ministry over the years say, well, when my kids are grown, I'll go on the mission field. When, when I, yeah, yeah. No, no, you're emotionally tied to situations, and you're not, you don't realize that you've got idolatry even in those emotions. And it sounds so good. It sounds, my mother and father, oh my goodness. And then there's a story in Mark chapter 10. As he was going out on the road, one came running. Now these people are begging to be a disciple. And Jesus is still clarifying their need. So you can beg to be a disciple, but God's still going to minister to your need, what you need. The third one came running, knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he answered, Teacher, these things I've kept from my youth. So he came running. His emotions were into it. He knew the scriptures from the time he was a child, and he felt that he obeyed them. Clear conscience, good mind. And then Jesus says, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and come follow me. And he walked away sad. What was he ministering to? His will. He couldn't let go. You have to have all of those intact for transformation. God created you a spirit, soul, and body, a tripartite being, but that heart is composed of your spirit and your mind, will, and emotions, and all of them need to be subordinate to the Holy Spirit. And learning how to do that is very, very important. Uh, the, the, the Christians can be intellectually handicapped because you don't understand the spirit. And you don't understand the spirit because the mind, the will, or the emotions could very well be in the way. How do we learn how to get all of those? Like these three disciples, Jesus knows what you need. You can ask him and he will tell you what, what's necessary. But, <clears throat> but primarily, uh, and even with spiritual warfare, that's a hot topic right now, spiritual warfare. And spiritual warfare is absolutely necessary because we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. There's spiritual warfare going on all the time. The weakness that I see with spiritual warfare is many are looking at the enemy outside of them only. If you want to win the battle out there, you win the battle in here. You don't win the battle in here. You're not much good out there. And everything out there is going to overwhelm you. And you're going to be in spiritual warfare constantly. But it's your own flesh that's been undealt with that's beating you up. And it's putting a sign on you so demonic activity can have a heyday with you. You're just an accident going somewhere to happen if you don't deal with the battle within. And you only deal with the battle without. Now... I'm going to show you, as the Holy Spirit taught me, what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong, okay? And how many have been trained prophetically? You feel like a prophetic person. Okay, I have to deal with you first because you're the ones that confuse the situation sometimes with the prophetic, the visualizing. Okay. Um, 
first of all, I could still remember I was a, I was a baby Christian and I was getting people delivered from tobacco just like that. Just laying hands on them. You know, God will do it any way he wants to. But I had this one person that came up and said, oh, I just don't, you know, I don't know. And, and you know, I could feel the, the, the anger coming from her. And I'm going, well, you know, why don't we deal with the anger before we deal with the cigarettes, all right? Before we deal with the nicotine. And I said, close your eyes. And just like typical prophetic people, she closed her eyes. What do you see? Puff the magic dragon. I go, okay, <laughs> let's put... Now, here's the interesting thing. Prophetically, you cannot minister to Puff. We cannot bring forgiveness through Puff. We cannot crucify Puff. We cannot get Puff the magic dragon to repent. <laughs> Prophetic people, you, 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 can't, you can't distinguish between what's happening now and what God speaks to potential. All right? There's a difference between what's happening now and potential. So the potential was, I said, okay, and this is the way you tactfully do it. Let's put Puff on a shelf right now and close your eyes because what you need to deal with that anger is a work of the cross, not prophetic pictures. Let's, let's put Puff on a shelf right now. And by the way, it was accurate as a prophetic word, but not for what she needed. She needed, just like Jesus with these disciples, she had some hostile, angry stuff that was emanating from her. You don't deal with that. You're just a walking time bomb. So I says, close your eyes. I want a real person. No imagery. No dragons. No, a real person. Who's the first person? We're going to pray you through my mother. Okay, now, what's the emotion? Hatred. And I see myself behind a high school smoking cigarettes because I was mad at her. So she didn't really want the cigarettes. She was finding a way to get in her own way, even with her mother. So I said, Okay, now look, when Jesus was on the cross, I, I, watch, I watch even Kingdom Life people do this wrong in the beginning. Jesus didn't go on the cross and say, Father, I see, I see a river of forgiveness flowing from me. Did he say that? No. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Real people, <coughs> not imagery. I don't see a river of forgiveness flowing from my belly. It either is or it isn't. What, do you, what did he see? I see those people. You face it with reality, not imagery. And you say, I see my mother. There's anger down here. Now down here is your heart, your spirit, your conscience. And if you do something, doesn't it say unless you forgive from the heart? Forgiving from the head does absolutely nothing. And people will struggle with forgiveness for years. And God, I don't understand. It's instant. And emotional healing is as easy as breathing when you do it from the heart. It's, it's sad because I still hear people do it from the head and it doesn't do nothing. And, but if you do it from the heart, now look where my heart is, all right? My will is here. So what do I do with my will? Didn't Jesus want will, emotions, and thoughts? All three. And a clean conscience. How do I get a clean conscience? Forgiveness. I let the forgiver in me. And who's the me I'm talking about? If it's coming from here, it's the new creation me. They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with Him. If I do it from my head, oh, I forgive so-and-so. Oh, yeah, 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 out of sight, out of mind. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forget. I like to know how they do that one. I'm going to forget about it. Just forgive and forget. <laughs> you can't do that. All right. You can ignore, you can suppress, but what gets suppressed will get expressed later. 
And you, do, you don't avoid an emotion by changing the subject either. That is one of the most common ways to skirt the work of the cross. But if I see my mother up here and there's anger down here, then it's Jesus and me, the new creation. That's who's doing the forgiving from the heart, the real you. Who's the real you? The new creation. What is the definition of new creation? They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with Him. Can I function apart from that new creation? Yeah, you can do it from your head, which will do nothing. We had third graders at CSCL say, everybody knows there's no living water in your head. Third graders. So come on, let's, let's, let's not be third graders. We should be smarter than a third grader, right? So who's forgiving when you forgive from the heart? The new creation you? And it's by grace, the empowerment of God, you and God joined together. Because nobody can forgive sins except God. But God says, if you don't forgive, your Heavenly Father won't forgive you. So we're obligated to forgive. But who's the you? Who is the you that's giving? It's got to be the new creation, you from the heart. Oh, how we struggle in our head trying to do the right thing. All right? So here's what I did. I prayed. I prayed her through until I could discern. Of course, it's not about me discerning. It's about you can discern what's going on in you. When Jesus approached these three disciples, they knew what he meant. Oh, I need to think it over. Oh, I got to let go. Ooh. Oh, I'm still not ready. He wants me to come right now, and I'm attached emotionally. I have soul ties to mom and dad at home. I release forgiveness to my mother. I'm still back on the girl smoking who was mad. And how do you forgive? You don't put fancy pictures up here of Jesus smiling and holding your mother. Oh, I've heard that kind of nonsense. Do you know what that does, by the way? If you start putting the prophetic visuals in with the work of the cross, you sabotage the work of the cross. You're actually lying in a sense because you're saying, I see my mother, and you need to forgive your mother because there's anger in here. And now you're changing the picture to, oh, my mother's smiling. Do you know down here, if you see your mother smiling, oh, I see Jesus holding my mother. You're changing the feeling down here that is not the cross. You changed the subject. You avoided, you avoided dealing with your pain. You avoided dealing with the issue. You found a way to move away to make you feel better. You see, you see why people would do this? They don't even know they're doing it. But you avoid the cross of Jesus. All you did was appease your flesh momentarily. I'll show you another way that it was done. I had a friend of mine at a large meeting, and he was ministering to women who were abused and molested, and they were weeping. And he had them come forward to the altar. And they're crying. Why? Because what he said touched the pain in the situation that they had transpired. In some cases it was an abortion. And they could feel the pain. And they could picture the time they had the abortion. There's the pain. There's the abortion. Come forward to the altar. Lift up your hands and let's worship. Well, while you stay there long enough, you just change the subject to what? You went from... Abortion, trauma, to worshiping Jesus. I'll tell you what, you say worshiping Jesus and you're going to feel better. That is not ministry. That's changing the subject. That is not ministry. Because you could take that person that now they feel better, say, come here, tell me. Did you go through an abortion? <laughs> the pain's right there. It didn't go anywhere. You didn't bring it to death on the cross. You did not have a supernatural transaction. Everybody in Kingdom Life Church ought to have that term memorized. When you got born again, you had a supernatural exchange or a supernatural transaction, whatever word you want to use. And how did you know there was a supernatural transaction that took place in the heart? Am I going too fast? Okay. How did you know? Peace supernatural peace. Peace with God, peace with yourself, peace with one another. That was an indication that your born-again experience, becoming a new creation, had a supernatural transaction. 
And how do you know you had it? This is not theoretical. This is not for your head. This is for the heart. How did you know that something changed? Peace. So we don't change the subject. We look for, I see my mother, and I'm not going to put Jesus in the picture or open doors or all kinds of paraphernalia to water down the emotion. I see my mother, I feel the hurt, and I'm letting Jesus take the hurt. That's the cross. But you only have to see it momentarily because Jesus in his grace and forgiveness will take it away right away. Instantly. Instantly. And if your experience in forgiveness has not been instant, you've been probably sincerely doing it wrong for years. From the head. What's hard about head people, though, is they're sincere. Tell me the truth. Could you be sincerely wrong? Yeah. yeah <laughs> that's, and you know what? Try to minister to someone and tell them they didn't do it right. And you, you'll get a manifestation sometimes. <laughs> How dare you? Can't you see those people when Martin Luther told them, you just ask Jesus to come into your heart, cleanse your heart. After I've been doing kneeling on glass and earning peasant, now you're telling me it's easy. I hate easy. I want it hard. <laughs> God will take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. You can get worn down. You know when some people finally forgive? is they get worn down trying. <laughs> and then by accident, they got so worn down by trying to forgive that they actually just dropped down and let it go. <laughs> and I went, whoa! But then they develop a bad theology that it takes a long time. You have to exhaust yourself before you finally let go. All right? Now, praying with this lady and the Holy Spirit's teaching me, and she was Puff the Magic Dragon, and we put it on a shelf because that's, that's prophetic. That's something yet to happen if it's accurate. If it's accurate, it's yet to happen. The cross now is what? We got to deal with your anger, and we can't get Puff to forgive your mother, all right? We know it's your mother now, you told me. So now we got a real person. Forgive your mother, and what are we looking for for a supernatural exchange? What is the clear indication that you did it from the heart? Peace. False peace is when you just change the subject. Uh, my mother, uh, oh, well, you know what? She did the best that she could. That's an excuse. That's rationalization. Then there's not only rationalization, that's one de uh, defense mechanism that the mind uses. The other one is basically... Pro, uh, projection. I see it in politics all the time. Angry people accuse you of being a hateful person. <laughs> it's like, no, it's mirror. Projection means what's really wrong with me. And you don't even have to have discernment to see this one. When people are projecting, they're blaming you for what's in them. Unresolved. Then the third one is tricks of the mind that keep you from getting real ministry, is suppression. Change the subject, ignore it. But emotions don't die, they're buried alive. Jesus is the only one that can take your pain and your sorrow. All you can do is suppress it or go get medication. That's, that's your choice. Because emotions don't die. They get buried alive. And what gets suppressed will get expressed. Okay, so I'm praying with this lady. She got her mother. She finally forgave her mother. And she also shared why, in her mind's eye, she saw an actual situation. That's different than a prophetic picture of eagles and dragons and everything. She was behind the school in rebellion to her mother and decided to smoke cigarettes was one way of her to get even with her mother. There's Puff the Magic Dragon puffing away. So what she saw in picture was accurate, but it wouldn't work until you deal with the real issue. We have to take a real issue to the cross. I'll give you another example. Uh, I prayed with a pastor who said, I'm, I'm going to see my father, and I've never gotten along with my father. Uh, 
for years, all the years. Uh, I don't think his father was saved. But he said, I'm going and I'm going to meet with him. Will you, uh, I'll be in Fort Mill. Can you pray with me? And I said, yeah. So I set up an appointment and I pray him too. I said, who's the first person or situation? I knew we were supposed to be there to pray to his father, but still. Trust the Holy Spirit to search your heart, not man. Holy Spirit was the first person to me and goes, I see water behind a brick wall. Okay, this is the pastor now. I said, put the water in the brick wall on a shelf. Who is a real person? My father. And then the pain came. It worked. Prophetically, exactly what he saw came to pass, but there's no healing in it. He saw his father felt the wall that he had put up because his father was not receptive to him. And he let from the heart Jesus in the new creation. He forgave. And while he saw his father here and it didn't, there was no supernatural transaction till it changes to what down here? Peace. That's the cross. If it doesn't change to peace, you didn't do anything. Peace is an indication that the grace of God empowered you to make the transaction. Just like salvation, it's no different than your salvation experience. You made peace with God. It had to happen here. Even if you don't know what happened. <laughs> all right? And all inner knowings are seeing, hearing, or touching, communing, spirit to spirit. As a matter of fact, if you wanted to make a little little diagram besides these three little scribes, each one having to deal with one particular aspect, mind, will, or emotions. But if you take it all to Him at the cross, whether it's a thought, whether it's a will that's, that wants to do what it wants to do, or a thought that is contrary to the Word of God, or an emotion, which, by the way, only until the late 1990s, I believe, right, Jennifer? She's got the dates down, memorized. I don't. But in the late 1990s, even in biology, they're teaching now that emocognition, emovolition, that the emotions control the thoughts. They're the power behind the thoughts. And the emotions control your choices. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That kind of throws everything. And here all these years, I was ministering successfully to people as a baby Christian. Counselors were sending people to me. And the only thing I was doing different than them was they were dealing with their head. I was dealing with their heart. I kept saying, what do you feel? That's a toxic emotion that needs to go. And now they're teaching emocognition, emovil. If you don't touch the emotion. Here, here's another way of doing it. Look at it like this. This is simpler yet. You know these three disciples? They all, one had a mind problem. They needed to think it through. The other one was emotionally attached and had to deal with that. And the other one had a strong will and didn't want to let go of all his riches. That was the rich young ruler, right? All right. Here's another way to look at it. Uh, I'm going to have to modernize the terminology because young people won't get this one. But the mind is like a steering wheel in a car. And by the way, it's always active. It's always it's going, if you turn all the lights out in a room and it was pitch black, the mind would be looking for a light under a crack in the door or something. It's active. It's always, but it's, it may not be going anywhere until what? The emotions are like the motor, the engine in a car. You got a steering wheel and you got a motor. And the motor could be running, brrr, and you could be turning the steering wheel all over the place and you could be all over the place and going nowhere because you didn't engage I was going to say the clutch, but how about for uh, that standard transmission? All right. For those of you who are not familiar with standard transmission, that would be putting it in gear like drive. That's your will. And until you put it in drive, no matter what kind of motor is going, no matter where your steering wheel would like to go, nothing happens until, there's no behavior until the will clicks in. Does that help? So to really go somewhere in this automobile, <laughs> All three have to cooperate. Otherwise, you could sit and idle forever, vroom, vroom, race the engine. You can be emotionally all over the map and 
you could, you're, you could have runaway thoughts all night long. You're not going anywhere, but at night, and you're not making any decisions, but you're all night long, you're thinking thoughts. That steering wheel's just going over here and over there. Not getting much sleep. We have to bring those thoughts captive. Now, wait a minute. How do I bring a thought captive to the obedience? Down to here. Until I have peace. And then I have to accept or reject the thought based on is it scriptural or not. Now, back to our pastor friend. Who did you see? My father. And I could feel for him the feeling and the emotion was like a wall. Like I'm going to protect myself from him because he doesn't accept me. I'm putting up a wall to him. What was his prophetic insight first? Water behind a brick wall. Okay, but that's not going to do anything. What did he do? He felt the brick wall. He felt the wall. And he knew that any wall other than the peace of God, which guards your heart and your mind, is an illegitimate wall. The only legitimate wall in the kingdom of God for a believer is peace. Let the peace of God guard your heart and your mind. And when peace guards you, even if somebody's a lunatic and they're attacking you, you may be able to, from the peace of God, you may be able to perceive what's coming from you, but you don't have to suck it in and own it. It will guard your heart. Kind of like a screen door. As a matter of fact, you're, if you can stay at peace in the midst of a hostile environment, you have better discernment than anybody else in the room. Because... The love of God on the inside precedes that peace. Peace precedes your perception of what's really going on because you're not taking it personal. You're not poor me in it. You're not a victim. You're basically like an observer. We are citizens of another realm. And God's trying to get that kingdom through us on earth. So that means your perspective is going to have to be spiritual, not carnal. You don't see with your eyes and hear with your ears, but you open the heart. When he released that forgiveness, he felt, all these years I didn't know I had that wall. Because he didn't feel particularly sinful. It felt like he was just protecting himself against his father's uh, lack of approval. He justified it, rationalized but that rationalization can keep you from walking in the spirit in the true sense. So he went and he emailed me later. He says, I went and visited my father and had the most wonderful time of communication. We cried together. We laughed together. We spent time together. All because he removed the wall that was in him. That blame game has got to die. You're Christians, you're the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. You should be the most forgiving people. And the blame game just is, is just, that's, it's total carnality. That's for unsaved people. That's all they know to do. But it shouldn't be named among you. You should be forgiving one another, tender-hearted toward one another, loving one another. And quite frankly, you know, we taught the Didache. One of the things I learned in that early church, when they discipled and mentored new believers, they taught him to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And they said, not the God that brought you out of the land of Egypt, because that's for Jewish people. The new Gentile believers, the God who made you. And you love him with all your heart, and you love your neighbor as yourself. As a matter of fact, you not only bless your neighbor, you not only pray for your neighbor, try fasting for your enemy. I don't know of any Christians that fasted for their enemy. I haven't had any Christians tell me lately, oh, I've been fasting for my enemy this week, for the people that have been picking on me. But you know what? These were baby, baby Gentiles in class number one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your enemies. Bless your enemies. Pray for them. Fast and pray for your enemies. This is class number one for new Gentiles. And they kept saying the same thing. Remember now, this is the, they're talking to Gentiles that are just getting training now to see if they really want this Jesus life or not. You want to be part of this Jesus movement or not? There is two roads. There's the road of life and the road of death. And great is the chasm between the two. You know what? I think Christians, 
I think the culture shock that the, that the early church experienced with Messianic Jews suddenly being introduced to a culture of Gentiles is no different than what a real believer enters into now. You give me some new believers now coming out of the world and it's going to be the same culture shock. Everything that, that, the, that the, the Didache taught them was wrong is acceptable in our culture right now. For such a time as this, I believe the Didache is coming out to show you how to disciple people. That we, the church is being more infiltrated by culture than it is by the Word of God. We're picking and choosing in the Word of God what we like and what we don't like. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He didn't change just because culture changes. And the values remain the same. Do you know in the beginning teaching, right, in the first couple lessons, what did it say? This is the way of death, killing babies, abortion. They'd leave them out in the cold. That was a very standard procedure for Gentiles. If it's a girl and you don't want a girl, just leave her outside. Let the elements take her. Matter of fact, early Christians were accused of cannibalism because they were rescuing these Gentile babies that were being left out in the cold. I'll tell you what, it was, it was a different world. It was, it was why I could see why John Wesley, when he wanted real Christianity, went back to the first century church. Second century tops, right? He didn't go beyond that. Because beyond that, there was already, well, it was inundated with heresies right from the beginning, but there was protections even for a new believer against the heresies. They knew the, they knew the creeds. They knew some things that were simple, like the, I believe in God the Father, you know, Jesus Christ is the only Son, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered. Okay, that at least kept them out of some of the major heresies. Just having a simple foundation. these enemy within is going to have to be dealt with. Let me, those of you who are note takers, write this down. This might help you. If you want to understand uh, lordship, I know Jesus is in you. You're a new creation. But to understand lordship, the intuitive should rule over your thoughts. The word of God and the intuitive. The word of God and the intuitive. That's a product of your spirit. Spirit should rule over your thoughts. The intuitive and the Word of God should rule over your thinking. Conscience should rule over the will. What's conscience? Conscience is that, that voice of your spirit that says, <clears throat> don't do that. And here's something that we covered on Tuesday night. We're probably going to cover it again and again and again. Your conscience is more sensitive to behavior than it is motive. Should have been there Tuesday night. We went into depth on that, but I'm going to give you a brief. Some people, will, their conscience will say, well, I didn't murder anybody, I didn't commit adultery this week, I'm okay. My behavior. But did you want to? See, that's why we ask, Holy Spirit, Psalm 139, 24, 25, search me, O God, because up here I've got 2,000 thought patterns moving at any given time. Right now, while you're sitting there, while you're watching by YouTube, you've got 2,000 thought patterns. I'm hot, I'm cold, I'm starting to get hungry, my stomach's growling. I, I wonder how long this sermon's going to be. I wonder if you know. I don't, have a, I don't have a pen to write this down. I don't know. I don't know, normally take notes. I should have taken notes. I, yeah. All right. 2,000 tops, no matter how smart you are. 2,000. Every second. 2,000 thought patterns. Go. A lot of them recognizing me. Me, myself, and I, how I feel, how I think, how I, 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 All right. But in the non-conscious, 400 billion every second. Can you see the difference between you going, I can't think of anybody to forgive. I've seen this my whole Christian life. It just amazes me. Oh, you're so smart. You're smarter than God. You can't think of anybody. 
How about close your eyes and say, Holy Spirit, search my heart. You're going to come up with some different stuff. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He, he, he's going to show you stuff. And then what happens when people close their eyes and say, oh, search me, O God. David said this, search me, O God, for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. And reveal to me any, David says in Psalm 19, secret faults. Well, who are they secret from? David. He was humble enough to know that I don't know everything in my head. Head people, listen, you're missing out. You're sabotaging your Christian life. And in some cases, you're proud of being a head person. Don't be proud of it. Pride comes before a fall. That head needs to be under the lordship of the Word of God. You need to reject every thought that's not scriptural, every impulsive thought, every intrusive thought, every condemning thought, and bring it captive to the obedience of Jesus who's in you down here. It isn't about up here. You want to win the battle out there? You want to win spiritual warfare like I'm hearing from every corner of the church right now? You want to win spiritual war? You win the battle within. And you'll minimize the battle without and you'll have the kind of anointing to go forth. God showed me a vision. Now here's a visual that's legitimate. He showed me a vision of our church. And I saw golden lanterns. And I was quick on I said, God, but I see it's so vivid. He goes, yep. It's going to be like the wise virgins who had their lamps full of oil, didn't they? The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord or the candle of the Lord or the flashlight of the Lord, whatever you want, searching all the innermost rooms of the belly. If it's a golden lantern, what does gold represent? The divine nature. I saw lit lanterns of gold filled with all the fullness of God. I'm telling you, the glory's coming. And it's going to be made available, and it's not going to be the foolish virgins, it's going to be the wise virgins who have. To have oil flooding with the divine nature means you are filled with the fullness of God in Jesus. It's Ephesians. It's the prayer of the Apostle Paul that you might be filled. Golden lanterns. They're not ones that are going, don't. You know, what would be a foolish virgin? Someone who got saved and basically going to live whatever way they want to. How do we get the gold? How do we become a partaker of that divine nature? What's it say in Peter? How do you become a partaker? It says, by the precious promises of God. Otherwise, why do we have promises if you just get saved and you're done? If you just get saved and you're done? Why have precious promises at all? Those precious promises are to deliver you from the corruption that's in the world so that you escape the corruption and partake of the divine nature. You partake of the divine nature, you escape the corruption that's in the world. And when you escape and partake of the divine nature, you get the gold. You partake of the gold. I want gold lanterns. I want no brown lanterns. No black lanterns. No lanterns that's kind of barely lit. But even those, you bring your dimly burning wick in here and we're going to blow on it and bring some life to it and cause it to get fired up a little bit. We don't have any lazy Christian. If you're a lazy Christian, please go to a different church. Because if I can't, if I can't get a, put a fire under you, I don't think you want it. You should, you should be, oh, I can't wait to release more of my flesh to the glory of God so that I get more gold. That's the gold you need, the divine nature. And how do you get the divine nature? You escape the corruption. How do you escape the corruption? By the precious, exceedingly great and precious promises. You become a partaker that escapes the corruption. You escape the corruption. You partake. You partake, you escape. Ah, it's a good deal. All right. So, now, how many know that a true work of the cross has to involve your conscience, has to involve your spirit, the voice of your spirit, it has to be a pure conscience, clean. Oh, how do I get a clean conscience? I need to receive forgiveness. If there's something there, I receive forgiveness. I got a clean conscience. My mind needs to be sober, willing to submit to the intuitive of what God wants. In other words, I want to be so emotionally 
deep in His presence, my emotions, the peace of God and the fruit of the Spirit rule. The fruit of the Spirit is why God... Why did God give you emotions? You know, if we go by the church's history, they've so downplayed emotions that they would just have you skip it altogether. And that's why we have such a mess. You cannot be more spiritually mature than your emotions allow. Put that in your pipe. But don't smoke it because I have to do deliverance on you. All right? You cannot be more spiritually mature. We have so overemphasized the intellect. Even in the Word of God, emphasize the Word, the Word, the Word. But how about, how about this? I was trained in faith camp when I, when I was a, a, a new believer and studied everything they had. And one of my favorite verses was, life and death are in the power of the tongue. Until the Holy Spirit asked me, uh, how do you see that? And I said, words. So then I said all the right words. And I said, no, you're half right. The power of the tongue, the power behind the words. Because what good is it if I go, <laughs> perfect love cast out fear, <laughs> perfect love cast out fear. If fear is the motive in me, if fear is ruling, me saying the right answer isn't doing anything. Because my flesh has nothing to offer. That flesh has to be brought to death. I receive forgiveness for having that fear. Oh, I feel peace. Perfect love casts out fear. When I say perfect love casts out fear, now it's coming from the peace of God. It's coming from Lordship. Let the peace of God rule. Who's ruling? When you say let the peace of God rule, suppose you're letting the peace of God rule. Who's ruling? It's either Jesus in you because there's, or it's false peace. Let the peace of God rule until there is a supernatural transaction down here and you face your pain, you haven't done it right. So much we call ministry. Let me give you another example. How about break it off? All, all my friends do this. But what I do is I go up to see, uh, occasionally it works, but occasionally it doesn't work. When does it not work? is when the person expected you to do something and they didn't have to participate. <laughs> they just, you, uh, you pray for me, you do it, okay? So one time I was following uh, a prophet up in uh, Connecticut and he, he was ministering very accurately. And he was ministering, now there's another, remember, the prophetic could be accurate and you can still do it wrong. Even if the prophetic is accurate, even if the picture is accurate, you can still do it wrong, right? All right. So here's what he's doing. He's going, he's prophetizing this young lady. I just see the Lord taking you on missions trips and, and God isn't going to bring you into a full circle now and your gift mix is coming together. And God says, and, and, and by the way, that, that second grade teacher that humiliated you, that shamed you in front of the class, I break that off you in Jesus' name. And they kept on going and prophesying. Well, I could feel her when he said that second grade teacher. And he broke it off her. I walked up to her later, and I was the prophetic word rule. I asked her, was that accurate? She goes, yes, in the second grade, uh, a teacher came and brought me in front of the whole class and humiliated me. Was the prophetic word accurate? When I talked to her about that prophetic word, the shame rose up while she was talking about it. So something didn't get broken off then, did it? It was accurate. You see, you can't confuse an accurate word that's foretelling something or speaking to potential and, and equate that with the genuine work of the cross. I had her come forward and I just said, here, let me pray that through. I can still feel the shame, right? And she goes, yeah, when I say that, let Jesus, who's the only one that can take our pain, our shame, and our sorrow. And just as easy as that, she did it for, close her eyes. See, the good thing is when some people close their eyes, believe it or not, they actually do it right. They go down here instead of here. And she released forgiveness and she got a smile on her face. She didn't have to tell me by discernment that there was a transformation. The countenance change was an indication because when she talked about the shame, she could feel the hurt. I think we have a ways to go with ministry. I've even seen this one because discernment was something that I got when I got filled with the Spirit at a level that my, even my peers didn't seem to understand it that much. And I'm not bragging, I'm just simply saying it was easy. Um, I, I noticed that 
uh, some people were saying they were ministering to people. Uh, someone say, oh, you know, uh, I keep using that same term now. Somebody needs to hear it. I, thought about, uh, I had an abortion and they had the hurt. And someone else who could feel the hurt had the same kind of feeling themselves. They go over and they, and they call it ministry. That's not ministry, that's identification. You know what it is? Two people need the same ministry. Some of them become activists because now they got a cause to go correct it by works. And that can be a good thing. We, we ministered to 250 abortion clinic directors. Pro-life. Pro what did I say? Abortion clinic directors. No, no. Directors of pro-life. And the vast majority of them went into that because they did have an abortion. Okay, But here's the part. When we, we, we were there for two days, we ministered to 38 people. They had a trained counselor, that, by the way, who ministered to two people in the two days because they talked forever in their counseling approach. And we did 38 just by praying them through. We could have done more. <laughs> And of the 38, many of them had an abortion, but many of them still had the pain, and they needed freed from the pain. And we saw out of 38, 38 got set free, and were blown away that that was still there. It was hid in activism. A good thing, but nonetheless, it was activity to cover, just think how much more active they could be with a pure heart, and not the anxiety of of identifying with somebody. Jesus identified. You don't need to identify with them. You need to set them free and show them how to go to Jesus in them. Okay. Freedom, real freedom, has to be expressed within a law. So the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus set you free from the law of sin and death but it has to be a transaction that takes place here. You know what, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna kinda close right now, but I wanna do some questions and answers, and for the sake of the video even, get some of the questions on, any questions on this? Because this is a lot to take in if you've been a church person for a long time. Anybody? I'll make up questions if somebody don't ask me one pretty soon. Huh? Who has never experienced what I'm talking about? You don't think you've experienced it. Come on up, let me pray with you then. <clears throat> That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking out there and everybody knows how to do this because most of you are in small groups and you're all you're doing. But we have a visitor. Thank you, Jesus. And her name is Sylvie. Okay. I'm going to stand this side, on this side. This is my better ear. Okay. All right. We're going to do just what we talked about, only we're going to actually do one instead of talk about it, okay? So close your eyes. Now, put your hand right there, just as a reminder that this is where everything good happens. And we're not going to have you say names. We're just going to say the first person in an attitude of prayer, the first person or situation that comes to mind, all you do is nod your head. Every thought and this is everybody, not just women, has a corresponding emotion right here. Can you feel the emotion that's attached to that thought? Then let, aw, oh, let Jesus in you go to it and right through it. Don't try, just let it happen. When you open the door, rivers of living water flows out. Remember, it's God who is at work to will. There you go. It just changed the peace. Am I right? Oh. So there was hurt. Did you see how easy this was? This is of someone for the first time doesn't know what we teach or how we do that. But because all the parts were connected, God's showing you that His grace is sufficient. And the scripture that most people pay almost no attention to is Philippians 2, 12, and 13. You say, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, and it sounds like you got to work at it. When in reality, it says, for it is God who is at work. So who did that? 
was Jesus. You're Jesus. And there's a countenance change already. But I could feel her pain by discernment, and that's where I learned this. But God says, they don't have to have your discernment, Dennis, because I've made it so that every believer can discern what's going on in them. It helped me to discern, to know that some people were saying the right answers, but they weren't really doing it. Then I had to find tactful ways to say, well, maybe we ought to go a little deeper on that because you don't want to tell someone who's sincerely doing it wrong that they're doing it wrong, because that all that'll do is put up a wall. And they're like, Let's try another one, okay? Let's do one more. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Now, and the reason that we say, you picture the negative situation or person momentarily is because you only have to feel it long enough to legitimately give it to Jesus. Right. Otherwise, it's abusive to sit there forever and picture something horrible momentarily but without presenting it to Jesus by skipping the momentarily you're really not doing it you're guarding yourself from feeling the pain we avoid pain at all costs I had a, 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 a marketing experts wife uh, answer when he says honey he goes how come he gets people willing to face pain why would you face pain? She says, you didn't hear what he said. He said, momentarily. How many people will face momentarily to be set free for a long time? That's a good deal. Okay, let's go for another one. Close your eyes. We're just going to do two. And, and let the Holy Spirit bring, and don't change the subject. Don't go to a different, I don't want to deal with that. The next person or situation, nod your head. Feel the feeling, nod your head. Then let, allow. You see, I'm using the word let, allow, not try. Let, there you go, you just did it. Is that great? Is that great? Now see, here's what you learned. You won't need me. That's the beauty of it. You literally, this is the way I taught Jennifer, who was trying to forgive somebody for two years. I showed her this one time, and after that, she goes, I can do that. She had a point of reference. So this whole teaching today is to give you a point of reference so that you and Jesus can deal with your stuff. The only time you need another person is once in a while, if you struggle, confess your faults one to another that you might be healed. You might need to say it to somebody else just to humble yourself. But 99% can be done you and God by yourself. Thank you, Sylvie. Thank you. Now, there was someone who knew nothing. We did this in grade school and had fantastic results starting at kindergarten. 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 Little girl wouldn't go to bed at night. Had to leave a light on. She was afraid. And she had four years old. But she knew she had Jesus in her heart. And I said, well, Jesus didn't give you that fear. He don't want you to have fear. He hates fear. Me too. Then don't, don't take it in. Okay, me and Jesus are going to bed. <laughs> and you don't have to leave the light on. Perfect love casts out fear. Her love for Jesus casts out that fear. Okay. And... I pray with that little boy. I'm going to close with it. I keep saying I'm going to close. This is the last one. I prayed with a, with a third grader who missed a whole week of school. He was at CSEO. Missed a whole week of school because during the summer he got a pet rabbit. And he was playing and he tripped and fell. Landed on the rabbit and the rabbit broke its neck. And he, in his own mind, was a murderer. He knew it was an accident, but it was still his fault. He missed an entire week of school. So he finally came the day Jennifer and I came to do a class. He was there sitting like this. And the teacher told me what happened. And I said, all right, anybody have something bad happen to them? Uh, so I said, he's at least raising his hand. Come on up and let me pray for you. And not go through a long thing, but in a matter of seconds just like Sylvie. In a matter of seconds, we prayed him through, and he got a countenance smile on his face, sat down in a seat, 
And the intuitive started ruling over his mind. He goes, oh, because it started a chain reaction. Once the kids saw that, all of their hurts surfaced at the same time. I overfed my fish and killed it. And my grandma died. My dog ran out in the street and got killed. And oh, I, so I had all the praise for them all. And when I got done, he was sitting there. I have a revelation. I said, you got a revelation? I, go, I saw my rabbit playing with her dog in heaven. That's what I think. <laughs> Made him feel good. All right. When he was 18 years old, fine, handsome young man, he came up to me and he said, do you remember me? And I said, no. He says, I'm a rabbit boy. <laughs> I go, oh, okay. He said, what I learned in the third grade, I've learned to walk it out with Jesus. The rest of my life, I learned how to, how to commune with the God within, that it was Jesus in me, the hope of glory. And he says, and when my uncle died, who was like a father to me, he said, my grieving was the same way. I had to release it the same way I did back then. I had to release it. You know, we say it at funerals, but nobody pays any attention. Father, into thy hands we commit their spirit. When you really let go, you're free. And I'm not going to go there, but biblical grieving was 30 days, sometimes longer, but it wasn't all. It's, most of that is us and our attachment not wanting to let go but they're not yours. They belong to God, not to you. So it's hard, but we, most of the, most, even Christians grieve far too long. But when we have a rule of thumb, we say, if you lose a loved one, don't do anything crazy for a year. Because don't make any major decisions anyway. You should be able to deal with it much quicker than that, but still, to restabilize, reorient your life, a year is good. Okay? Did you learn something? And you had no questions, so no, don't come up to me now. <laughs> You're afraid of the camera. Does everybody know the difference? When to use imagery and when to stay away from it? Okay? Don't confuse prophetic pictures with the work of the cross. You need real people, real situations. And when I learned that as a baby Christian, my first, my first episode, besides the one with me, was my foreman at work. He hated Christians, by the way. And I saw, when I saw his face snarling at me, down here it went, <clears throat> like I like to slap him. <laughs> Probably worse than that. And God said, Dennis, don't let anything come between what you and I have together. And it melted my heart. God showed me that that emotion was coming between me and him. Communion was heart to heart, breath to breath, spirit to spirit. Don't let any person or situation, and don't fall into the traps of the three, uh, the three uh, substitutes of rationalization, uh, projection, and you know, repression. None of those work. They all pop back up later anyway. As a matter of fact, the projection actually fortifies it in you. Hmm? You hate somebody long enough and you think they're the bad person and you're fortifying that hate in you. You're making it stronger like a muscle. So, Father, seal this work and pray for those people watching by YouTube. We just pray that they who began a good work are going to continue it. Learn how to function from the heart and not the head. Learn how that all those parts... Everybody should know all four parts that need to be under the Lordship of Jesus, right? Mind, will, emotions, conscience. You want to know the will of God? You need all four of those neutral. Neutral means I'm placing my thoughts because your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. I'm placing my choices because your ways are higher than my ways. I'm, I'm placing my conscience because you're the only one that can cleanse it and wash it and make it clean and pure so that I have no foggy lenses, that my perception is clean. I have a good conscience, clear conscience. And my mind is open to the intuitive, the revelatory, 
It's open primarily to the Word of God because the new creation, me down here, loves God and loves His Word. Anything that does, I hear in my head that doesn't love God and love His Word, that's not me. I'm not taking it in. Anything that doesn't love God and loves His Word, I'm not taking it in. The real me loves God. Do you believe the new creation you loves God and loves His Word? That you're going to have to get a little more adamant about not <clears throat> tolerating a bunch of goofy thoughts that are not scriptural in your head. So we seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we didn't seal it before you're leaking, seal it again, God, so they don't leak. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, amen. That means I'm done. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.